So I'm going to go to uh, the next question, which is about inverses, about functions and inverses. Of course, we just looked at functions, a quadratic function and a hyperbola. That's as good as they get, right? Uh, if you know how to do a, a, a parabola or a quadratic function, a hyperbola, a linear function, and you also need to know how to work with inverses, you're just good to go. You won't have any challenges. Right. So this one reads as follows. It says, in the diagram below, the graph of f of x is ax squared, right? Um, is drawn in the interval x is less or equal to zero, right? So let's draw that, okay? We've got the Cartesian plane. The examiner has uh, a beautiful Cartesian plane here, right? Only showing which quadrant, the third quadrant, right? They've got a graph here, which I'm going to draw in yellow, which looks like that, right? And you can then see that this is actually a parabola that has been cut somehow, right? The domain is just focusing on x values that are smaller or equal to zero. Remember, the complete graph would look like that, right? So if you decide to see, I'm going to chop here and only keep the left leg, this is how the graph is going to look. And that's going to be the graph of f. Now, the question proceeds and says the graph of the f to the power minus one. So they wrote this, right, um, is drawn. But we should know that this implies the inverse, right? So they've got not the derivative. We did a lot of calculus. People might confuse the derivative um, with the inverse. If it's f to the minus one, then that's the inverse graph, right? So they're seeing there's also an inverse graph, which apparently looks like this. Very funny. And we are told that the inverse graph passes through some random point R, but it's actually written as f to the power of minus one. Right, so on the yellow graph, on the yellow graph for the graph of f, there's a beautiful point with the coordinates negative six and uh, negative 12. We're expecting them to both be negative. They're lying on the third quadrant. Okay, beautiful stuff. And we are uh, told that uh, point P is a point on the graph of f and R is a point on the graph of the inverse. Okay, so there's another point, which is point R here right, with uh, unknown coordinates. Okay, no problem, no problem. All right, so the first question reads as follows. It's a quick one, this one, so we're gonna run through it much, much quicker. Um, number one, number one, uh, you guys want us to answer the following question. It says, is the inverse a function? Motivate your answer. Is this um, a function, All right? Now we need to motivate, okay? We need to do two things. Motivate, right, we need to do two things. First of all, a simple yes or no, right? Is this thing a, a function or not? So there's many ways of trying to see if a particular graph is a function or not, right? And my famous method is what I call the vertical line test, right? So you draw a vertical line, you just take your ruler, take your ruler and run your ruler across the graph and check at any given point, do you cut your graph once or more than once? If you cut the graph once, all the time, right, it means that graph is a function. But if you cut it more than once, then it's not a function. We call that the vertical line test, right? So I'm going to use that as my argument here. So if I wanted, I could have drawn a line here, guys. I'm gonna draw a blue line, right? And I'm gonna run it through. And I want you to focus on the inverse. The inverse is the green line, right? If I draw this, if I put this as my vertical line, you will agree with me at any given time, when I move this, it will always touch the green graph at one point. Look at it. Every time, wherever I am, I'm just touching it at one point. It doesn't matter where I am. As long as I'm keep, I keep moving from left to right or right to left, it doesn't matter. Every time I'm running my vertical line on top of, the, of this particular line, I'm always going to touch it at one point. So that actually confirms that this is indeed a function because it passes what we call the vertical line test, right? So I'm gonna be fancy here and say, is this a function? Yes, the answer to this part is yes, it is a function, right? Why, yes, it is a function, okay, why? Why are you saying it's a function? Concept, concept. Why are you saying a function? Because, here's the mathematical symbol for because, if you didn't know, because it either passes the vertical line test or you can say because it is a one to one relation, right? This is us now trying to be fancy to show people that we know English and we know difficult mathematical terminology, right? This is to say for every single x value, there's exactly one y value that corresponds to that particular x value. So this is a function as I see it now, based on what is sketched here in my graph. If I was dealing with the uh, original inverse of a graph such as the one that I have at the top, like this graph here that you have at the top, its inverse, 
would look like this, right? And if you try and draw a vertical line, you'll notice you're going to cut it more than once, which means this then is not a function, right? This wouldn't be a function because you're cutting it more than once. So I will have problems there. But in the context of what was given to me in this question paper, in this exam, this green line is a function. Yes, it's a function because it is a one-to-one -one relation or because for every x value, there's exactly one corresponding y value. Oh, number two. Now, if r is the reflection of p in the line y cross to x, write down the coordinates of r. So r is the reflection. Okay, they're telling us it is the reflection by line y equals to x. By the way, this is a question that can be answered by a grade 9 child. Why? Because you should know when you reflect stuff by the line y cross to x, which is where the whole concept of inverses actually comes in, you are just going to swap the x and the y. That is actually what is going to happen. What is x becomes y. And what is y becomes x. You just interchange them. That's all you're going to do here. Right. Very simple. The inverse works like that. The inverse, all the properties of the original graph can be transferred right, to find the properties of the inverse. By doing what? By interchanging all the x's and the y's, just swapping them. So in this context, they're saying r is the reflection of p by the line y equals to x, so I'm just going to swap the coordinates of p to get the coordinates of r. Very simple. Again, the examiner is not saying calculate. They say write down. What is the meaning of write down? It means you are looking at the answer in front of you. No calculation is needed. Just swap stuff, and then you got the answers. So let's write it down, right? So how is that going to look? Look at that. So p is minus 6 and minus 12, so I'm going to have negative 12 and negative 6. Free max, absolutely free. No complications, I'm done with that one. Okay, cool. Now I'm going to go to the next question, 4.3, that says calculate the value of a. All right, you want me to find the value of a? The value of a. Where is this a? Well, a is apparently a variable in the equation. The opening statement told us that f of x equals to ax squared. All right. Now, you people, if you've been watching this show, you will remember what I said about points that lie on graphs. This thing is as good as saying y is ax squared. So for me to solve for this in order to find the value of a, I just need a point. I just need a random point to replace or to substitute for y and to substitute for x. Then I'll be able to solve for a. No complications here. So I'm going to go to my diagram and ask myself, a is part of the graph of F. Do I have a point on the graph of F? Look at F. F is the yellow graph. Do we have a point on the yellow graph? Yes, we've got point P. The coordinates there are minus 6 and negative 6 and negative 12. So this is going to be my X and that is going to be my Y. Substitute those in the given equation, you are good to go, right? In fact, let me do it here. So Y is equal to AX squared, right? My Y value is negative 12 equals to A is unknown, but X is negative 6 and that needs to be squared. You square that, you got negative 12 cos to A multiplied by 36, and then you divide both sides. You're going to get an A value of 12 over 36, which is something. You're probably wondering, what is something? Well, something is 12 over 36. I'm, I know it must be negative because I'm looking at that, the fact that the A value has to be negative since, uh, first of all, the graph is a set phase parabola, and secondly, you're dividing a negative by a positive. So my answer comes out as exactly negative a third, right? Negative 1 over 3. This is what the examiner wanted, so I've answered the, the question that uh, they wanted me to do. Okay, cool. And the last question says we need to find uh, the equation of the inverse in the form y equals to something. All right, okay, cool. So um, we just found that a equals to negative 1 over 3, right? So examiner says find the equation. Find the equation, right, of the inverse. Ah, oh, beautiful stuff. Beautiful. No complications right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the graph of f. Remember what I said to you. I said if you know the properties of the original, you can find the properties of the inverse. So um, the original graph was given to us as f of x, right, equals to a, which we just found to be a third, right, x squared. That's how it looks, right. So this is as good as saying y is negative 1 of 3 x squared. This is a 3 marks question. Where is the first mark? Well, the first mark is on the fact that if you are looking for the inverse, right, for inverse, you swap them. For the inverse, right, you just interchange x and y, right? You just interchange them. If you've got a point x and y, what happens is they just swap places. So wherever I see y, I'm going to put x. 
and where I see x, I'm going to put y, right? But they said they want y to be the subject of the formula, right? So how do I do that? Well, I don't like uh, fractions, I hate them. So how do I undo division? I undo division by multiplication, so I'm going to multiply by negative 3 on both sides. You multiply the left by negative 3, you're going to get negative 3x. You multiply negative and negative, you're going to get positive 3 and 3 will cancel. You'll be left with y squared. And then you take the square root on both sides. Now, this is where fight starts because most of you neglect this part. Remember what we said. Every time you introduce a square root, you need a plus minus, right? Okay, so this means that my y is apparently plus minus the square root of negative 3 squared. No, no, not 3x squared, but just negative 3x. Right. Uh, awesome stuff. Right. This is what we end up with. Now, we can't keep both. Let's go back and check what this means on the graph. Now, it means your graph looks like this. This is how the inverse looks. This is, this piece that I just drew now is there because of the positive part. Right. This is there because of the plus square root negative 3x. Right. And now this piece here is there because of the minus uh, square root negative 3x. We can't keep both. Why are we not keeping both? Because the examiner did not keep both. They only kept one of them. Which one? The one that lies on the third quadrant, which means the one we are interested in is this piece, not the one on top. So abandoned machine, abandoned machine. With this one, we don't want you guys. We only want the negative leg. So which means our conclusion will then be y, examiner, has to be negative. The square root of negative 3x. Let us always lose marks on this one. Please be careful. Check what I did there. It's important for you to understand what I'm doing. Right. And then, now the other question is, are all x values acceptable here? No, they're not. Because if you sub an x value that is positive, you're going to have a problem here. And you can even see that this graph is only covering the negative x-axis, which means we need to say examiner, remember x can only be less or equal to zero. I promise you with all this, then you're good to go. They'll definitely reward you and celebrate you for doing exactly that. Right. So this is actually very awesome. This is how you work with functions and inverses. They're not difficult. They're very straightforward. If you still have gaps and challenges, remember to go back. That's the reason why we teach you reading and writing when you're growing up in grade one, two, three, four, and five, and so on. Because we know when you get older, we're going to struggle to tell you everything. That's where now your textbooks come in. If you've got gaps on these kinds of things, please go back and reread. You are now more mature than you were a week before or even a month before, even before lockdown, right? So you guys are much smarter, you're wiser than when these things were introduced the first time to you, right? So when you go back and you try to reread on them, you're going to do much better than the person who just wants to grab them as they go. That's going to be the problem. So take your textbook, sit down, take your 10-fold education app, watch the videos, Try to read the stuff in the textbook and practice what we have covered from grade 11 work that is necessary for grade 12 work. So very, very important for you to keep that in mind. Before I go to the last question of the show, let me just add on uh, my recipe. I'm going to add on my recipe what I'm saying to you. I did say to you that it's important for you to understand what they're going to examine you on. Those are the six topics we spoke about. We did algebra questions, we did sequence and series, we did functions and inverse. We're going to attempt one financial math question, which we won't do in detail because of the fact that um, we don't have time. And then uh, with the Thursday show, we can also touch on differential calculus as well as probability. So also send us those questions. Remember I said you must always, always save time so that you can go back and check the work that you might have made mistakes on. Or some of the things, if they're troubling you, you can skip them. But remember to come back and work on them. So the other thing I want to say is practice, 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 which I can just say practice cubed, right? Always, always practice. Why? Because the more you practice with past papers, right? Past papers, they are available all over uh, the internet. We also have them on our app, right? Past papers, right? We've got a lot of very exciting things on the app. They're going to help you to understand how you need to position yourself and how you need to um, to think about the concepts that are going to be coming to you when you're going to be working with these things. So it's important for you to practice, practice until the, se to the second coming. Remember the following. The more you practice, the better you get at something, right? You're not going to get it first time. Like I said, you've got the, the blueprint of how the examiner is going to attack you, right? So if you feel like you've got problems with algebra, go study it. Okay? Then after that, go to past papers and double check the questions you have there. The more you practice, you're going to keep finding challenging concepts. And when you find them, then you can ask about them. But you're asking with direction this time, as opposed to saying, I'm lost, I don't know anything. The biggest, biggest problem is 
having knowledge, something here and a little bit of something here and a little bit of something there. That's a big problem. What I want you to know is a complete understanding of a particular concept. Concept over procedure. Don't just have an idea of how to do things. You must understand why are we doing what we're doing. You will never get lost. And you're actually on your way to getting a distinction in mathematics. We're going to keep unearthing more and more of these techniques as we go along with our shows. All right, so the last question is a short, short question. It's not complicated. It's a financial math question. Now, let me say this. You guys are from grade 11. You did financial math in grade 11. You did timelines, right? You understand um, compound growth and compound depreciation, reducing balance, straight line depreciation. You understand those concepts. You did them in grade 11, right? Uh, those kinds of questions where we say somebody deposits money now, after three years, they withdraw a thousand. After two years, they add an extra 1,500. And we want to know after 10 years, how much will be in this account. Those questions are coming, right? But in addition, in grade 12, there's something else that you're going to be learning, which is called annuities. There's a future value annuity. There's also a present value annuity. So we haven't really covered them. We're going to be able to cover them later on as we proceed with our shows. So just keep watching. But when you go back to school, it is an obligation of the teachers. On the 1st of uh, June, it's on. It's happening. You don't have a chance. Just start polishing your shoes and ironing your, your, your uniform. It's happening. The 1st of June, we are in. We are within. It's happening. You can't run away from that. You guys must be there. And remember the following. This is actually very important. It's not safe. We know that. People are very scared and you're skeptical. You don't know if you'll be protected or not. The important thing that I always tell people is the following. If I've got 30 people that I need to look after, it's going to be challenging. But if all these people are looking after themselves, then we don't have a problem. So what you need to understand is the following. When you're going to school on the 1st of June, when you're going back to school on the 1st of June, protect yourself. Keep social distancing, right, or um, physical distancing. Wear your mask, have your sanitizer and all that. If you protect yourself and your classmates also protect themselves, then we don't have anything to worry about because everybody will be protected. Look after yourself because you might not be sick, but you might get that and give it to the people at home because they might have problems, underlying problems that might uh, actually cause problems for them, right? So you might not uh, have any problems when it comes to you, but you might transfer that uh, virus from yourself to other people that are at home. So you don't want that to happen, right? Protect yourself and also protect your loved ones uh, by following what you are advised to follow. But then let's get to this last question, which we can literally do in about uh, this few minutes that are remaining here. Okay, so this is uh, a financial math question, right? And it is exciting because it covers both grade 11 and grade 12 concepts, but we want to get to the grade 12 part. We'll just do the grade 11 piece that is also examinable in grade 12. It's from a grade 12 past paper, and it's a question that was sent to us by Tepiso. Right? Thank you very much, Tepiso, for sending in this question. It reads as follows. It says, uh, determine how long in years, right? Find how long in years. Uh, it will take for the value of a motor vehicle, right, to decrease to 25% of its original value. If the rate of depreciation um, based on the using balance method is 21% per annum. Oh, that's a mouthful, right? You guys are scared of this one because it's weight problems. But don't worry. Find the keywords. Find them. And then iron them out. I promise you will be able to have the answer to this. So let's write that down. Determine how long. So I'm going to write that. Okay. Determine how long, which means find how long, right? That's the first thing that is important to me that stands out. If I have got markers, I just highlight that. That's the first bullet point I'm taking, okay? Um, in years, okay, it will take for the value of the motor vehicle to decrease to, okay, there's another weight, decrease to 25% of original value okay this is actually very important okay the next bullet point here uh if the rate of depreciation based on reducing balance here's another word reducing balance is another key word i see here uh and the last thing they're seeing here is this thing is going to reduce at 21 percent per annum. okay oh no complications right so what does each one of these things mean to us first bullet point determine how long what does that mean that means find n okay um, decrease to 25% of the original. Okay, I'm going to come to that. So this is what I call a pain question, right? If you're not familiar with pain, well, pain looks like this. This is actually a typical pain question, right? Pain. Uh, let me use small letter I because you guys are familiar with that. It's a typical pain question. We're looking for all the variables of um interest, right? The p-value is the original, the principal value of this variable. We were not told that. 
right? Because we were not told what that is. I'm going to call it X, right? And then A is what this thing is going to be later. They say it's going to decrease to 25% of the original. So if the original value was X, it means in future, it's going to be 25% of X, right? What is 25% of X? 25% of X and the interest was given to us as 21%, which is 0 0.21, and we're looking for N, right? So I'm going to be silly and say we know that uh, because they said reducing balance, the correct formula is A is P into 1 minus I to the power of N is the exponential one, right? We are looking for N. Let's substitute what we know. We know that 25% of X is 0 0.25 X equals to P is X, 1 minus 0 0.21, that's 21% to the power of N. We're looking for that, right? So call your calculator and ask it what is 1 minus 0 0.21. It's giving you... Uh, 0 0.79. So first of all, over x, uh, that is gone. I've got 0 0.25 equals to 1 minus 0 0.21, right, which is going to give you 0 0.79. Okay, 0 0.79 to the power of n. Now here is a problem. We are looking for n, which is an exponent. How do you work out unknown exponent? You log in. So log in on the left hand side. What you do on the left, you need to also do on the right. Log in on the right hand side to the power of n. After logging in, you can then download the n. You're going to have n uh, log 0 0.79 equals to log uh, 0 0.25. And then you divide both sides by log 0 0.79. You divide this side by log 0 0.79. That is gone. So the number of years that this thing is going to take is going to be, uh, you know, fraction. You can actually have log uh, 0 0.25, close bracket, over log uh, 0 0.79. If you close bracket, you get a 5.88. So 5.88, which is approximately six years. So I'm going to say approximately six uh, years.